Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, today with us a rare honor of having uh, Dr. Craig Miller, who really needs no introduction, uh, past president of the American Association of Thoracic Surgery, uh, who has uh, uh, had a uh, tremendous uh, scientific contribution in the field of aortic surgery and uh, we would like to talk to him about the management of a typical type A aortic dissection. But first, Craig, uh, why don't you introduce yourself for our readers? Thank you, Marco. It's my pleasure to be here, and I think it's a great idea that you and Andy Wexler and Joel Dunning have come up with to pin us down, put us on the spot, and hopefully tell younger people how we bail ourselves out of trouble. The <clears throat> whole idea of this interview, of course, is to go through a case in a stepwise manner, first starting with the diagnosis, uh, preoperative decisions, operative tactics, and then see some special situation. So the hypothetical case is uh, a patient, a 55-year-old patient, uh, hypertensive. Uh, he is uh, admitted to a hospital some 25 kilometers away from you and uh, the initial we has a chest pain and initial uh, CT scan shows um, AOT dissection. What is your first reaction to this news? Our first reaction in Stanford is to take the call, not believe anything that's said and try and get the patient there as fast as possible so we can sort it out. Yeah. Now there's one big change that's happened in the 30 years I've been in the field is in the old days, and you remember the old days, mm -hmm. they would have to be transferred, they would have to have a, a selective angiogram, mm -hmm. and there was no AeroVac, um, yeah. a medical helicopter service, yeah. and there was a big degree of natural selection going on by the time they got to us and we did our diagnostics and then mm -hmm. acted surgically. So the fact there is a CAT scanner in this small hospital and there is in every hospital yep. in the United States has really expedited and facilitated, but the false diagnoses are rampant. Mm -hmm. But the first thing, if they smell, suspect a section, they say yes, how soon can we get the patient here and then sort it out when they get to our center? Uh, the usual mistake which is seen uh, repeatedly, regretfully I've seen it myself several times, is the patient who gets to uh, uh, transferred by ambulance to the emergency room and somebody due to the some minimal changes in the EKG gives uh, a thrombolytic drug we have or heparinize the patient. We have seen that too, acute uh, mm -hmm. MI, Q, uh, uh, aortic syndrome is a small fraction of acute chest pain yeah. and they, they just have to think, 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 smell the section. And the National Marfan Foundation is on a crusade in the emergency rooms in the United States to educate the first line responders to think dissection even though it's rare. But it's a no fun when they've been given thrombolysis or the diagnosis is made inadvertently in the cath lab trying to minimize the door to balloon time for an acute MI. Yeah. Uh, given the situation which we are discussing now here, a patient is, let's say, let's speak in English, it's about 20 miles away, you would still consider error evacuation uh, using helicopter or the ambulance? It, de it depends on your local um, yeah. situation. That's not very far, but if it's rush hour in mm -hmm. New York, um, I think a helicopter would get mm -hmm. them there faster. But mm -hmm. if it's a it would probably be most expedient ground ambulance with, in our field, uh, Joel's question said, should a physician accompany the patient? Uh, that happens rarely, believe it or not, it still happens with a caring doctor, but it's usually um, a paramedic in the life flight helicopter team. We're very good managing these ill dissection patients on the way in. Do you give them any advice uh, when they load the patient in the helicopter concerning blood pressure? To Absolutely, and our people, when they get there, the the life flight nurses and paramedics will get the necessary monitoring in. You don't want to transfer a patient with a 20 butterfly in the wrist, which is commonly the case. So you get your proper arterial monitoring, uh, adequate venous access, you start your esmol drip if the pressure is high, and uh, our, our people over the decades have really gotten good at doing what we would do in the ICU in the, in the HELOC. Uh, in case the referring hospital has no access or the CT has broken down, uh, would you rely upon transthoracic echo as well? Transthoracic echo, as you know from the early days, is okay if you see a flap, but otherwise it's worthless. Mm -hmm. But if the clinical scenario, the great masquerader, the mm -hmm. section is known as, if an astute physician or nurse smells something funny, 
we'll go on that suspicion and say, we'll get them here as fast as we can and we'll sort it out. The CT scans have a lot of false positive diagnoses elsewhere too, but we'll get to that when, after they arrive. Okay. Uh, the patient is uh, in your hospital. You are in the transport and uh, being referred to your hospital. Uh, do you immediately prepare operating room or will you... Uh, there are some discussions about waiting if there is a problem with the distal perfusion, whatever. What's your opinion? This is a very good question and, and we've done it both ways at Stanford. Um, but what my personal preference is today is to transfer that patient directly from the helicopter to the operating room. And there in the operating room, we will look at the outside CT, confirm or reject their diagnosis, do a TEE with the anesthesiologist right there, clarify the diagnosis, find the site of tear, and then act appropriately. If they don't have the diagnosis, well, maybe we've wasted some money, but we've gotten the ability to act quickly, and the delay in our, in our CVICU can be several hours. And then you have to mobilize the operating room, and we've had patients rupture while they're being sorted out in the ICU. So if I go right to the operating room, you have all the resources you would ever want to figure out what's going on, including the site of terror, for example, the retro A dissections where the site of terror is way down the descending. Well, we'll go from the operating room to the cath angio lab and put a stent graft in those mm -hmm. patients if they haven't ruptured or have tampon on to uh, cover the tear. But if it's a a surgical case that we can then proceed expeditiously. Yeah. Time is important, especially if there's end organ ischemia. Uh, you've seen, of course, the papers that have been published by Ann Arbor Group. If there is, let's say, loss of uh, peripheral pulse, and that they will wait until the malperfusion resolves. What's your opinion? This is true for acute Bs, complicated acute Bs, and malperfusion and acute A's. And Michael Deeb and uh, Dave Williams at, at, at Michigan and now Patel, they've been on this course for 15 years, and it stemmed from, I'll never forget the paper where Mike Deeb first presented this at the STS 10, yeah, about 13 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And he was, there were rotten tomatoes and eggs being thrown at him. Hans Borst wrote a scathing editorial saying, this is nuts. Uh, but they turned to that because they had had such dismal results operating, replacing the ACMA on people who are already dead with coronary ischemia or, or gut or ischemia, visceral, or visceral kidney. Ischemia. So they, they were gun shy from that experience and then they developed this new approach, correct the peripheral mouth perfusion with stents and fen stent and, and now stent grafts resuscitate the patient and then a few days later do the ACE in the order. Mike Deeb just presented his most recent update three days ago at the Greek Mount Sinai Symposium and it works but it's not reliable. We gave up fence stand and, uh, below because we couldn't bank on a result to rectify the ischemia. Mm -hmm. Then we got stent grafts and that's much more definitive and reliable. But the you problem to cover, to to cover, cover the, the primary, primary tear, yeah. say an acute B with malperfusion yeah. and time, the clock is ticking and you have to move yeah. fast. Stent graft covering the primary intimal tear is the quickest thing we can do to reperfuse the patient and then resuscitate them and do something perhaps more definitively. But Mike in the Michigan uh, data, the most recent iteration, shows that uh, yes, you lose uh, quite a few early because you've already got irreversible end organ damage, and then half survived to get the ascending dissected. The other half died of ascending rupture. So you've lost a lot. Further, the long-term follow-up, which Patel and Deeve are now, and Williams are now publishing, interestingly, you have that early hit where you lose a fair number of patients, but late you see continuing attrition out to three, four, five years with the peripheral fenestration stenting. Yeah. You don't see that in the three large series, including one from Stanford. If you do a stent graft for oh, mouth the primary collapse yeah. B, collapse true lumen and a B. You do lose patients early because we got yeah. there too late, but thereafter it's remarkable and very interesting that the survival curves yeah. out to three, four, five years are flat. And you don't see that in the Michigan experience and I, I don't know how to explain it. I, I, I think that, is, that school of thought is pretty much confined to Michigan. I had the suspicion that this is a really a luxury of a tertiary referral center. 
when you are on the front line and you are getting them very early in the first six hours after dissection and they have a loss of peripheral pulse this is a luxury you cannot afford because there will be a mortality within the first 12 hours it's really atrocious and, and in our early surgical experience visceral or renal infarction was one of the strongest predictors of death because we would rush right to the operating room, replace the ascent and aorta, hope the distal mouth perfusion sorted mm -hmm. itself out. Uh, most often it does, but not always. But there in Michigan and at our place too, if they do have something that where you're, you don't know if the gut is dead mm -hmm. or the uh, uh, something irreversible has already occurred, then there may be a rare role to do something interventionally, percutaneously, mm -hmm and then watch and wait for a brief period of time. Well, I don't want to say too much, but let us it's a very interesting subject. The patient comes in there, there is a weaker pulse on the right side, and the first blood gases are drawn, and uh, there is a drop of pH, and the lactate is elevated. Uh, you, you, th this would be an you, alarm. You'd better get the team rolling one way or another, and we would, go, we would be in the operating room when we saw the bad news mm. coming, and able to act quickly. Mm. Uh, but then you would go on the ascending aorta because he has an ascending dissection. If it's a type A, yeah. uh, with mm -hmm. especially if there are complications of the type yeah. A, pericardial fusion, tamponade, yeah. bad AR, yeah. coronary ischemia, we would just mm -hmm. open the sternum and do it. Uh, Without going to the cath angio lab or a hybrid OR and trying to do, deal with the distal problems and mm -hmm. then wait it out. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, situation, the patient comes, uh, you decided uh, CT is positive, there is a type A dissection, you don't know quite exactly where the tear is, normally the CT is not specific enough. Uh, what kind of a cannulation you do? Well first we'll find out where that uh, tear is while we're prepping the patient. The anesthesiologist will be yeah. doing the TE echo yeah. and you can almost always find the tears. Yes. Tears plural. Yeah. And then so we'll know uh, in advance. Now where do we cannulate? The textbooks used to have it dead wrong, but they've gotten better. And I have always said, going back to Randall Greep and, and Shumway in the early days, if you're going to use femoral peripheral perfusion, which I abhor, mm -hmm. I don't like to pump any human being backwards, even if I don't like him, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that can go wrong. But if you are going to use femoral perfusion, you should go to the side which has no pulse or a weak pulse. Now the textbooks used to say go to the side with a good pulse. Yeah. The side with the absent or weak pulse is more likely going to be connected to the true, true lumen, yeah. so your perfusion will get where it has to get. The good pulse is where the false lumen re-enter, and mm -hmm. you're going to be perfusing the false lumen. The big bugaboo in dissections of perfusion backward yeah. is you have no control of where the perfusion where is goes, going to yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, so your preferential way would be subclavia or axillary artery? Axillary artery. Uh, axillary artery meaning in here? No, not, in, not in the XL. The delta, not in the XL. Delto pectoral groove delto -pectoral laterally. And I, uh, so by definition it's a subclavian artery. It's lateral mm -hmm. enough it's the axillary artery because the subclavian artery, as you well know, is the worst artery in the body. If you look at the number of lamellar units in that artery, it's bad. So okay. it's a little bit lateral and it's be underneath the vein and in big muscular men it can be very deep. But that's our first choice. Yep. If you have time, if they're arresting uh, or you're pushing on the chest, um, then you can go to femoral quickly yeah. just to get on the pump. Or you can do what they do in Hanover, Germany, which is yeah. open the chest and stick a cannula directly in through the aorta. Have you ever tried room. that? Uh, not yet. I've kept it in my pocket really? if I'm ever in a bind. And uh, it works in Hanover. Yeah. The reason I don't like it is you have no way then to perfuse the brain and protect yeah the brain while you do your arch work. If you have the axillary and it works, you can just clamp the anomaly and you have your anti-grade cerebral perfusion. Yeah. Now the neurological complication rate at Hanover, as much as I yeah. love those guys, and Oxl yeah. Harbridge was at Stanford yeah. years ago, has been in the 20-25% range for two and a half decades and has not come down with as time. Yeah. So it works in a bind, stick a cannula with TE guidance in the true lumen, but then you're left with nothing for the brain. But uh, th this is really mysterious, this ascending aortic uh, cannulation, because when you look at the acutely dissected 
aorta and there is some blood in pericardio and you look at it and you can almost see the blood flowing and it's, ha it's, it's hamburger it's dark blue purple black hamburger yeah and how does it hold the suture you have to fix it somehow Axel Harbrich and the Hanover group have said very carefully if you read the fine print and in Essen they're doing this too Heinz yeah. Jakob you find with your finger and the TE guidance where you have full thickness aorta yeah. into the true lumen. Don't try and go through that paper thin yeah. false or it's going to explode on you. Yeah. And uh, there was also previously in the very early times uh, the advocation, uh, there are advocates for the apical cannulation which will bring you by definition into the true lumen. The LV apical cannulation is the best kept secret in all of cardiac surgery and it was originally published by Kazui when he was a resident and Wada when he was the chief at Sapporo in 1975 or something like that and they developed that when they were doing mitral valve surgery through a left thoracotomy they would get the venous drainage from the pulmonary artery mm -hmm. cannulate the aorta through the apex that's where it started and then it's been reincarnated more recently with mm -hmm. others taking credit for it but it's Kazui and Wada and that is an excellent trick um, to get on with true lumen perfusion instantly, as long as they don't have a previous prosthetic valve, of course. Yeah, and sometimes you use it also yes. now? Or with yes, we, we, the residents all know about that because maybe once a year, twice a year, we have to resort to it. For thoracal abdominals, we can use that yes, as a course. perfusion for the proximal body. The, uh, it's a little, it's much easier through a left thoracotomy and thoracal abdominal yeah. decision to cannulate. You don't have to With a sternotomy, you have to pull it up, but you can do it. And there's a Scandinavian surgeon who's now repopularizing it. Yeah. So it's a good trick to have in your pocket uh, when you're mm -hmm. in a, a bind. Yeah. <clears throat> when you start the perfusion, you have uh, performed the arterial cannulation and you are going uh, with the vein come Where do you put the uh, venous cannulation? Venous cannula is usually direct. Right to, to, stage, to yeah. stage, yes, uh, two stage, to stage, to the appendage. Uh, the worst situation is when you have, let's say, arterial cannula just barely in, or, or you are putting in arterial cannula and uh, the blood pressure is gone. In the axillary right. artery? Yeah. Blood pressure is gone and uh, there is obvious tamponade. Uh, is, when is when the you go on the you are, yeah. You, you're not, your chest is not open yet, you have just started. Oh, something bad yeah, goes happen. Something happens in this critical period. Is it a lost battle or can you still salvage a patient? Number one, when we <coughs> use the axillary artery for CPB perfusion, we always put a little short graft on it. We gave up years so never, ago. So never direct. Years ago we gave up direct cannulation because we destroyed too many yeah, fragile yeah. axillary same, same with me, always. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic has published that it's safer to put a little graft on. Yeah. Um, but if they arrest right then and there, keep the incision open, open the sternum, uh, decompress the tampon on it, maybe up with a finger, a little hole, not too big a hole. Yeah, you don't want to decompress too, too much. To the pressure. The pressure will go through the roof. And then you can, if they come back right away, you can continue in the axilla. If, if you can't get them back and they arrest or there's full rupture, then you can uh, stick an arterial cannula through the wall into the true lumen. Or if the inside of the aorta is looking at you mm. under semi-visual mm. control right into the aorta and put your finger around it, cool like crazy. Yeah. And that brings in the question of cooling. You're bringing it up. Okay, we, the chest is open, you performed axillary artery cannulation, the graft is on, you attach on the pump, uh, two-stage cannula is in the right atrium. How much do you cool? We will cool um, not near as much as we used to because we now have the luxury of selective antegrade cerebral perfusion. But we'll try and get the ears tympanic membrane temperature down to a 20 to 25 range. So it means you go with a full cooling uh, yes. when you're going bypass? Full cooling. Uh, right away. Water Try four degrees and uh, the what? Water in the pump oxygenator as cold as it maximal can be. gradient, cool as fast as you can. Uh, barbiturates, um, uh, steroids, uh, still put ice on the head like Randy Greer yeah. taught us years ago. Yeah. Mannitol and uh, yeah. furosemide. Mannitol yeah. not so much for the usual use but it's a hydroxyl radical scavenger yeah. for uh, ischemia reperfusion and the furosemide is a superoxide radical yeah. scavenger. And uh, the dose of barbiturate? 
it is small, 10 per kilo of sodium uh, So it's not the elimination not of the EEG? Uh, between the cold and the barbiturate, they get pretty flat, but uh, we do not monitor real EEG. We have these little uh, things, but we monitor the NEARs. Uh, near infrared. Near infrared uh, uh, spectroscopy. spectroscopy. Uh, will you uh, modify your technique if the near infrared spectroscopy shows some anomalies? The uh, symmetry is what you want. Yeah. And there can be problems with axillary perfusion. Yeah. It's not 100% of the time reliable. A flap in the anomaly yeah. or the subclavian of the carotid can block off blood flow to the the right carotid, and you can take your surface echo probe, which all our machines in the operating room have, and the anesthesiologist can actually put it, it's a low frequency probe, put it on the neck and look at carotid flow both sides. But if there is a discrepancy to, uh, from one side or the other, you better address it. And, and the first thing you might have to do is stop the axillary perfusion and go to something more direct. Yeah or uh, introduce simultaneously the... Simultaneous the femoral perfusion. So the usual unpleasant situation is you go on perfusion with the axial artery and the pump technician says my perfusion pressure is 300. Yeah. Well then you know you got a problem. Don't force it. You can get a cannula in the femoral artery very quickly and then watch the pump flow with the TE echo as you come on with the lower cannula. Make sure the true lumen doesn't become totally obliterated. Hopefully the flow will be in the true lumen. It'll stay it'll get rounder as you decompress the pulse. Will which, you insist always on the both radial arteries uh, monitoring? It's, it's nice, but we, we don't always have that. Uh, if these are usually in the middle of the night. Uh, and uh, going now, you're starting cooling, and what is the next step? You cool for, let's say, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and um, then? Before we leave the radial ar artery line monitoring, be careful not to measure the patient's arterial pressure on the right if you're using axillary perfusion, even with a graft, because it's going to be factitiously high. Always have a line in the left arm, and if able, the right arm. We cool as long as it takes. It depends on the size of the patient. Um, if you're in Japan, it takes 10 minutes, and they're down to 20 degrees. They're 50 kilo patients. If they're 120 kilo people like you and I operate on, it takes longer. But we don't have to cool down to the Greek 15 degree mm -hmm. range anymore. Uh, the, the, this, you brought up a very interesting uh, problem about the perfusion pressure in the right uh, radial artery. Uh, did you ever observe uh, a hyperperfusion of the right radial artery? Happened to me on two times in elderly ladies, and ever since we measured the pressure mm -hmm. and we will even clamp distal. Did you, was there a compartment syndrome? Compartment a, syndrome due to hyperperfusion in it. I haven't Have seen that yet, but thank you for the warning. Yeah. Okay. Now about the the deep uh, hypothermia. Well, you, moderate hypothermia. Moderate hypothermia. Yes. Because yeah, the bladders, the, the bladders in the high twenties. Yeah. The ears will be at twenty to twenty-five. Yeah. Uh, then the next step, you are you have reached uh, your let's say gold temperature, it'll be something 26 degrees uh, esophageal and uh, blood temperature. And then what? And then, well, we're going to try and avoid clamping while we're cooling. And that's um, a lesson I've learned over the decades. But uh, Dr. Greek was right way back when. He said avoid clamping. And if you do have to clamp for severe AR or something, clamp way down low in the ascending in a part of the aorta that's coming out anyway. Uh, because that clamp up by the anomaly can interfere with the true lumen, false lumen flow and fenestrations and uh, be a problem. Plus it can destroy literally. Yeah, and it can, the aorta can come right apart. Yes, yeah. uh, we've seen that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so you are still perfusing only the relying on your brain perfusion, only the perfusion through the innominate artery. For the, for the arch work, and we always do, except one of our attendings, we have a historical control. One of our attending surgeons, Dr. Oyer, still clamps acute dissections usually. The rest of us have gone to open distal uh -huh. and extended hemi-arch. So someday we'll be able to compare the results, but we still have a, a historical control. And will you put additional cannula into the left That's carotid? That's a good question. We, if we see a, a difference in the nears, in the area. we will occasionally put a separate perfusion cannula into the left carotid. And that's just a manually inflating pediatric retrograde cannula wide mm -hmm. to the arterial line. Mm -hmm. 
Nothing fancy. And what would you be doing with the left subclavian? And just put the balloon, or yeah, usually nothing. Um, you can. Uh, I like to clamp it to eliminate the uh, vertebral steel. Yeah. If you can't see it or get to it, you can just leave it open and operate because you're not there for very long. But you want to do an extended hemi arch. By the way, how much do we flow when we're on the yeah. axillary perfusion for SACP? Dr. Kazui's data in animals and man is all based on 10 mLs per kilo up all three branches. Mm -hmm. The nominate, left carotid, left subclavian. We, for better or worse, have usually gotten away with 10 mLs per kilo per minute up one side. But if we do see a disparity, we will put a second cannula yeah. up the left column. And then increase the flow. And the, the no, we keep the flow there. constant, but we, yeah. we uh, give it another way to get to the brain. And then hopefully the nears will equilibrate mm -hmm. and the temperature. Uh, the going quickly back to the arch surgery, if you have an elective arch gain, will you always insist on visualization of the villus circle? No, we don't have that luxury and, and rarely have that information. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that the circle of Willis is open completely in about 50% of patients. Yeah. But for all of the elective arches, and we do a lot of them, mm -hmm. um, over 100 a year, I, I almost never have to put a second cannula up the left carotid. Mm -hmm. Dr. Scott Mitchell does it more frequently than I. Mm -hmm. But we, and the, the, the circuitory rest or SACP times mm -hmm. are uh, short for an extended hemi arch. They're long for a, a total arch with multi-branch, yeah. but we usually can get away with perfusing one side, as long as the nears are, are similar and the temperatures in the tympanic membrane are similar. Our Japanese colleagues are extremely fond of branched aortic arch graft. I always considered it as somewhat courageous in an acute dissection. In an acute dissection, I think it's way overboard. But for the chronic dissection, after they've survived an yeah. ascending yeah. repair, it, we're using that almost all the time. Yeah. Now, Dr. Kazui, I, th I know what you're referring to, yeah. in selected young Marfans, he and only selected cases, he has gone to total arch, multi-branch, with the little teeny Kazui short elephant trunk. Not yeah. a real elephant trunk like you or I would call it, but it's just yeah. a little sleeve, a centimeter yeah. long. You look at his diagrams, it's there. It's inside the distal aorta. And then there's felt outside, and he gets a good and a good aortic cuff before he puts his multi-branch graft in. Mm -hmm. Also, he's going a lot farther distal than you and I would because these are small human beings, small subjects, yeah. and you can see the descending aorta to the level of the left main bronchus easily in these little people, and you and I couldn't see it if we did a thoracostrenotomy in these big people. But we, we uh, would reserve total arch replacement for very special circumstances in acute dissection when the arch is just destroyed or when there are tears all over the place or when there's a problem immediately downstream and that leads to the distal adjuncts, frozen elephant trunk, mm -hmm. uh, open E vita. Mm -hmm. When are these distal adjuncts ever uh, indicated in acute type A dissection? When your primary goal is to get a survivor and I don't think anybody has shown convincing data that doing something downstream with a stent graph of one sort or another, mm -hmm. or maybe even the Dumjotis device available mm -hmm. in Europe, mm -hmm. which is that night and all spring they mm -hmm. put in there, which I find very attractive. I don't think anyone's proven that that's going to reduce the incidence of late reoperation or increase the incidence of false lumen thrombosis. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep it simple, try and have a survivor confine the operation, the ascending and most of the arch. I've, I've uh, used this term extended hemi-arch. We have seen all too many redos where someone else yeah. did the yeah. ascending and all they've done is an open distal proximal to the anomaly. Yeah. You're cooled down, you're there, you can see it. Why not get as much arch tissue out as you can at that first operation? So basically what you advocate is an S-type incision which basically goes to the uh, ductus ligament. Ligamentum to the anomaly. Yeah. It's yeah. a sigmoid shape mm -hmm. and I, of course we use that for all our bicuspids where we're replacing yeah. most of the arch mm -hmm. all the time. Um, speaking of the special connective tissue disorders, if you know by the appearance it is a marathon you are experiencing, would you, this is a special case in acute type A where we would go for a total arch? 
That's Dr. Kazooie's preference in selected patients, but he's shown no difference long term in those where he did the total arch with the little Kazooie sleeve versus those he didn't. So the rationale, the justification for that bigger operation doesn't exist. Mark Moon at Washington University has shown that the more radical you get going distal does not influence the late results. So I think we have to be cautious here and not get carried away. The Cleveland Clinic has data that the circa rest, the more aggressive you get, it adversely impacts early and late uh, yes. mortality. Yeah. So we have to be careful. If you've got a young Marfans and everything is 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 obviously bad, bad tissue and destroyed by the dissection, sure, be aggressive. But in the middle-aged person, um, I don't think you, I, th I think total arch should be extremely rarely indicated. Going back to now our uh, hypothetic case, uh, you have a 55-year-old hypertensive patient it's obvious that there is a dissection goes all the way to the arch. You have performed your sigmoid incision. Uh, what graft do you use and how do you use it? Open aorta, no distal perfusion? No, it's, it's all open and no distal perfusion. And the cross perfusion. clamp is where? There is no cross clamp. That's the beauty, you, you of, stop circ it. beauty of circa rest and just clamp the anomenon, look at the back bleeding from the carotid. If it's reddish and, uh, and a little it's not pulse style, but if it looks good, clamp that, clamp the subclavian, get the blood out of your face, mm -hmm. and then do a, an extended uh, arch replacement. And I, we've changed, I have, dramatically over the decades. We used to use a ton of Teflon felt, like yeah. Dr. Grieve still does, inside, outside. 3-0 SH proline, which that needle will kill these tender aortas. So nowadays, uh, and Pat Daly was the one who first taught me this. I'll go to a, a 40 BB or a 50 C1 needle without the Teflon felt and mm -hmm. certainly without glue. We've never had GFR glue in the States. We have had, had a lot of bio glue and we have an epidemic of black aortas, full thickness necrosis from too much bio glue we used at the first operation. Bio glue is probably fine to dibble on your needle holes after you've done your suture line. But we do not uh, glue, I do not glue uh, the true and the false things together. Um, even on the sinuses of Valsalva, which we'll get to in a minute. So it's a fine proline, fine needle, and very, very... And collagen impregnated grafts. Oh, the grafts are the, the Hemashield uh, woven double velour now made by Maquette. Uh, what most people refer to Hemashield, but you have to be careful because there's a knitted Hemashield too, mm -hmm. called Microbelt. Uh, so it's a woven double velour Hemashield and we've been very happy with those grafts for over 20 years. They do not dilate. Some of the other competing grafts, are they stay wider, they don't weep, uh, but they're thin and I'm afraid they might dilate. Uh, you have seen actual dilatation. Uh, the reason why I ask, I have seen increase to up to 50% yes, of the diameter. Yeah, the uh, Southampton and other centers in Europe, perhaps mm -hmm. yours, have shown with the gel weave grafts there is dilatation. Dr. Grieve had a paper a couple of years ago, he didn't specify what type of graph, and they showed that everyone dilated, especially in the hypertensives. But the old woven double velour Dacron bovine collagen impregnated grafts remain our mainstay. So you would need about, let's say it's about 15 to 20 minutes at most to finish this anastomosis. And then you cross clamp the graft and then... Yeah, and in Houston you may need that short period of time because they're using a great big old needle and they're going fast. I, I use a teeny suture, teeny needle, and I go slow because I know I have one chance with that distal. By the way, while we're looking in the arch, if we see any big fenestrations, we'll try and do something with them uh, locally before we do that distal. Um, we just forgotten the one thing I wanted to ask you. How do you protect the myocardium? You don't cross clamp aorta, but you open the aorta, we have reached a certain uh, perfusion temperature, and then what you do to the heart. Retrograde cold blood has been what yeah. I've been using for every kind of case for 10 yeah. years or more. So this is during cooling you put a uh, retrograde? Not during period. cooling because you have coronary flow, but as soon as the pump's turned off, you start your retrograde. I also use a thing called the daily cooling jacket, which is mm -hmm. very slick, keeps that myocardium under 10 degrees 
and you don't have to give repeat. Especially the right ventricle. The right ventricle exposed yeah. nice and cold, and we'll measure right ventricular temperature a lot because we want to keep us on our toes, but just retrograde cold blood in the daily jacket. And now when you have a piece, you have attached a piece of graft, it is your uh, distal anastomosis is finished. What do you do next? We will remove the clamps and hopefully your axillary perfusion then communicates with the aorta, but you have to watch that with your TE echo. Mm -hmm. And as we uh, take off our clamps, we want the anesthesiologist watching both lumens and the descending to see what happens as we reperfuse anterograde. Mm -hmm. Make sure the true lumen doesn't become obliterated because all the flow inadvertently is getting into the false. Would it help you to have a femoral artery uh, pressure measurement? I think the TE echo is the way to go there. Sufficient. And it's, you don't need the flow so much. You're not going to see a lot of color because it's pump flow, but just the morphology and size of the two lumens. Ideally, you see the true lumen get bigger, false lumen get smaller. There's still sparklers in the false lumen, slow mm -hmm. flow, but you don't, what you don't want to see is the true lumen mm -hmm. compress uh, go away. And if that happens, then you know you've got a problem with antegrade flow. Get the femoral cannula in and perfuse on both ends. Uh, but then you're going to have to identify why most of the flow is getting from uh, the true to the false in the proximal descent. Would it be a rare occasion that you would put blindly uh, a graft, a stent graft, into descending aorta? Uh, well, I, I think there is a great future for anti-grade descending aorta stents or stent grafts. Mm -hmm. And if you had a Dumjotis device, which we don't in this country, putting that downstream to very gently yeah, yeah. fluff up the true lumen is a good idea. Or a, even a large wall stent, if you're in this sort of problem. You yeah. can do that under direct vision without fluoro, mm -hmm. with TE guidance, to try and get all the flow in the true lumen. But the, the reason there's a problem is there's a big communication somewhere and you just didn't see it. Or it tore after you recommenced reperfusion. So you've got to be watching, and hopefully it won't happen, but be aware and have contingency plans. Given a best case scenario, you have a good perfusion pressure, there are no inequalities, your near infrared shows no problem, and now you're faced with the ascending aorta. First, how deep down does the resection go? Uh, the, the resection will go all the way to the sinus tubular junction, and then the decision is, do you save the sinuses or do you do a complete composite bowel graft for Tyrone David valve sparing group? Uh, in that young Marfans, who's healthy, and it's been done all over the world, I haven't done it yet, he can make this operation a real big one by sparing the valve and doing a Tyrone David. And the results are actually quite satisfactory, but that's really making a big operation huge. The debate about whether you save the sinuses or replace them is long-standing. We don't have the answer. I don't think saving every root is the right answer, nor do I think that replacing every root with a composite valve graft is the right answer, as came out of Dr. Green's unit two years ago. That's silly. Let's be in, let's individualize our approach to the patient's disease. Are they Marfan's, uh, some other connective tissue disorder? And then the morphology of the root. Did they have annulo aortic ectasia before they dissected? Well, that's a bad root. You better get rid of it. Uh, is the root destroyed by the dissection? If it is, then it's silly to save it. In our experience, we looked at the separate valve graft versus composite valve graft. Uh, for various indications, and the results were the same five and ten years later. Same for us. Yeah. So individualize what you're going to do there. It's usually the non-coronary sinus that is most destroyed by the dissection, and this is an unbelievably great opportunity for Professor Sir Magdi Yakub's operation, mm -hmm. a uni Yakub, yeah. where you cut out one a lip, a lip, one tongue, mm -hmm. which replaces completely the non-coronary sinus and sometimes the right corner of sinus and reimplant the right. That is a <coughs> beautiful operation for acute dissection when it's just too far destroyed to try and glue it together or save it or wrap it or whatever. And all you also a core felt in this situation when you were going deep down into the sinus? I was raised on felt and this came up at Dr. Grief's meeting uh, a few days ago and I, I told them I haven't used felt really for 16 years. And, I, and, I, and Randy teased me, said, well, that's why you have such a big hat. You put all the felt into the hat. 
but I don't think you need it. In fact, I think it makes bleeding worse. It makes the surgeon sloppy and lazy. And instead of being careful with the needle passage and using a fine needle, you use a big needle and you think the felt's gonna stop all the problems. The felt and the big needle can make problems a lot worse. So again, we're using a fine needle. If you're doing a uni yaku, replacing the non-corner sinus, that would be 4-0 RB1 or maybe even 5-0 C1, fine proline. Just like you would a Yakub operation, if you like that operation, right at the hinge of the cusp. Mm -hmm. And then you can count on that anastomosis. There's nothing worse than gluing it or putting a bunch of felt in and have the non high dissolve as you come off pump. Yeah. That's a bad place to have bleeding. A very common situation is uh, you find a bicuspid aortic valve and it is not calcified, but the patient is 55 year old. It doesn't have almost none aortic regurgitation. Those are, can be good valves, especially in the younger. Uh, and we know that bicuspid aortic valve is a uh, has a much higher incidence of dissection yeah. than uh, other patients. So if it's a young patient and the valve's fine, functioning fine, I would leave it. Yeah. And there again, you can do a Tyrone David valve sparing route, or you can just leave it in the sinuses if they're not destroyed. Because that's probably going to function until their late 60s when it will inexorably calcify. <coughs> so they'll probably get more years out of their own bicuspid valve than they would out of a bioprosthesis. Yeah. And then some of them will live to the ripe old age with the, uh, with the bicuspid, bicuspid valve bicuspid. not calcifying. I wish we knew yeah. if all bicuspids eventually calcified or not. That's a darn good question. Yeah. We're saving bicuspids. Uh, 26% of our Tyrone David series, which is now 242 patients, are bicuspid. Mm -hmm. But we tend not to do that when they're in their 50s because we're afraid they're only going to get 10 years more before mm -hmm. they have AS and something needs to be done. <coughs> Given the case, you have now, <coughs> there is some, a preoperative, there is some aortic regurg. There was the dissection which went fairly far down in all three sinuses. So you need to resuspend the valve. You need to rebuild the root. Thankfully, the left coronary sinus is the is involved very rarely. Almost always the non, frequently the right, but rarely the left. And the left coronary is not dissected. So there you have to figure out how you're going to restore valve competency. Before you do that, you have to scratch your head and decide why is that valve leaking? Was it because they had a big annulus before and very little coaptation height? or is it all due to the damage and perturbations of the dissection, which is commissural detachment and prolapse. If it's simple prolapse, they had a normal root before, normal annulus before, then if you restore adequate cephalad tension on those commissures, the valve should function fine. And we were very proud of ourselves once saying we saved 92% of the roots and valves in acute type A dissection. That was probably saving too many. Mm -hmm. Again, you have to be selective. Uh, would you, let's say, measure it, put a hair dilator first and see what kind of a true annulus do you have? Something that's very difficult to assess the sure. actual size uh, without uh, measuring. A ball valve sizer or, or yeah. St. Jude or any kind of yeah. sizer. Because if they have pre-existent pathology, annular aortic ectasia is Denton Cooley's term, um, that patient's probably going to do better to have a composite valve graft with a bioprosthesis or a, a mechanical valve mm -hmm. instead of run the chances of a bad root doing something bad later on. Mm -hmm. um, when you are repairing now, the pro making the proximal anastomosis, you still use the same graft which you already put in or do you use another segment of graft and put them together afterwards? As you know, these grafts tend to be very short, <laughs> even if you're doing the extended yeah. peninsula style arch and ascending. Mm -hmm. Um, so you say, well, the last thing I need is two graphs, but I think I know the, the point of your question is that you can get a much better geometric result mm -hmm. if you use two graphs, yeah. even if they're very short and so on together. Doing that proximal uh, has to be done right, just like the distal, and to do it with one graph on tension and mm -hmm. do that back wall, I don't think you get the geometry as good as if you use two short graphs and so yeah. on together. Yeah, the geometry question is, the there's been raised a company, one of the companies makes also a curved graft. Did you ever try that? I haven't heard I have, of that. I've seen, I've seen a curved graft and it is really a, a simple trick. They, they just 
crimped it a bit, but it, it does not stay curved. It doesn't stay curved. I but would like to point out something about that. Using one graph pulling around that Dr. Grief has taught us for 20 years, and everybody doesn't get it. So the Japanese pirated Randy's idea, wrote it up, called it the Kala Lily technique. Yeah. And they, nobody gets it yet. But what Dr. Grief has always said, if you bevel a graph for a hemi-arch, everybody thinks the tongue has to go distal on the lesser curve. And Grief's point is you rotate it 180 degrees, the tongue actually goes on the greater curve by the anomaly to avoid this kinking and having the lesser yeah. curve too long. So at Stanford, I tell the residents, it's sane, that looks sane, the tongue on the lesser curve, but we want to go insane, so we flip it over 180 degrees, mm -hmm. like Grieve taught us, and it's much, much better. If you have the lesser curve too long, whether you use one graph or mm -hmm. two, you're going to have this right angle, yep. and you're not going to have the right cephalad traction on the commissure. You might have a leaky valve, as well as an ugly result with this yep. 90 degree. There have been yeah. even some reports of the, of the gradient, because it That's is so kink. much of the yep. kink. Yeah. So remember to turn that bevel graph, if you're doing a hemi-arch, Rotate it 180 degrees and take the tongue to the innominant and the short end, the heel, to the uh, ligamentum area. Yeah. Uh, we are finished with this. You said you only use only a minimal amount of glue on the whole process. One graft, two grafts, it's a probably a decision of the, about the distance between the arch and the annulus. If you will be using two grafts or one graft. They tend to be very short. Yeah. It is. In a, Unless there was a major previous aneurysm right. there, and that, which, which moves a and, lot. And there's that. nothing wrong with using one graph. I just feel I can get the anatomy of better mm -hmm. and have more security with the proximal anastomosis. Yeah. But uh, whatever works for you. But the, you, as soon as you take that clamp off, then you got to make sure that aortic valve's competent mm -hmm. right away. And this you check with the uh, transeos of a geo right. echo. Watch the ventricle, make sure it doesn't blow yeah, up. Then. Venting at all times. Um, Dr. Shumway never, except in the kids, never used an LV vent. <laughs> he's gone now and he's probably ashamed of us, but I use a pulmonary vein LV vent uh, pretty yeah. commonly. And we still have uh, patients where we'll use an old-fashioned LV apical vent, corbovinum long-standing AR. Yeah. Works great. Yeah. So you would just observe uh, if this rises uh, yeah. quickly and then And if you have a bit see problem, how much you're getting back. Yeah. And then as soon as you can, get them ejecting, watch the anatomy, mm -hmm. make sure you don't have residual cusp prolapse. Because if you see a morphological problem early, that would be the time to fix it. Put the clamp back on and do uh, what you can to fix it. You might have to shorten the free margin of a cusp. If, there's, if the commissures are okay, but you still have cusp prolapse. So you would use a running stitch in there? That would be a 6 uh, vortex, uh, and uh, I've never had the courage to run the entire thing, uh, especially in a Marfans, uh, like Jervine does in Brussels and Tyrone uh, says uh, he does. But just placate the noduli aronti. Mm -hmm. You shorten the free margin, suck mm -hmm. the cusp up, and get adequate and equal cusp coaptation. Yeah, Jochen Schaefer says excellent results with this running stitch. But those are older bicuspid valve patients. Yeah. Um, yeah. The young Marfans, there's just nothing to sew to. It scares yeah. me. Yeah, very thing. Now, we are finished with the procedure. You have uh, now done the anastomosis. You resume the circulation and you are ready to get off the bypass. Heart is going fine. What particular measures are you telling anesthetist and intensive care residents when the patient goes to the ICU after a repair of an acute type A? Well, even before we get to the ICU, first thing we're going to look at is the, the, the urine. And hopefully they're going to start to make urine again and uh, more as you get pulsatile. Check the peripheral pulses one way or another, yeah. and then watch the lactate and the acidosis yeah. because you have to beware of some persistent malperfusion in the abdomen. Mm -hmm. And then we'll watch for that in the ICU too. Uh, urine output, amylase, lipase, um, mm -hmm. any unexplained acidosis, and be very aggressive uh, and go to the um, cath lab at the least suspicion of residual. That would be the cath lab would be the next step, not the OR, but the no, cath lab. No, where we can figure it out and hopefully stand a true lumen problem in the SMA or something mm -hmm. like that or do a fenestration in a major branch. 
But just because you've restored flow in the true lumen in the descending aorta by your TEE doesn't necessarily mean that it all the important end organs are, yeah. are getting adequately perfused. Uh, the urine alone, if you have a dissection only of one renal artery, is not uh, indicative enough that there might be a problem. Uh, lactate or quick measurement of GOT, GPT, uh, the liver enzymes, uh, what else do you use for high index of suspicion? For you, if <clears throat> it's a trap, you may have lost a kidney by the time you realize yeah. that one kidney didn't have adequate perfusion. Um, but we don't do anything special except follow creatinine, the usual things. All these dissection patients will get a CT scan before they leave the hospital, and that was one of Joel's questions. Uh, how do you follow them? But we're pretty aggressive about routine surveillance scanning forever. And uh, are there some obligatory drugs which you give them? For instance, everybody gets beta blocker or? Everybody, we try make sure everyone's on a beta blocker. We um, uh, will use ACE inhibitors and ARBs when necessary for hypertension control, but we're cautious about them, and this is relevant to the marfan losartan study, because anything that dilates the peripheral arterial beds, an ACE inhibitor or a losartan, is going to theoretically increase aortic DPDT, which can theoretically uh, increase the probability of a dissection. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. you use your beta blockers or, or verapamil, uh, a calcium antagonist with a lot of negative inotropic effect first as your mainstays. Uh, there have been some reports on a, on a purely um, um, on a molecular biology basis. There seems to be some action of the beta blockers on the metabolism of the aortic wall in a sense of preventing further dissection. Just based on the on the clinical observation, the people under beta blockers seem to have less late problems than those who have been without. That's fascinating. So uh, there would be a, a, a two reasons to have these yeah, people on beta blockers. Not only purely DPDT and the hemodynamic, hemodynamic reasons, but also specific action in the aortic wall. That's interesting. Well. Craig, thank you very much for your interview. Thank I'm you. I'm sure the people will profit a lot from that, and uh, it'll, be, it'll never be an easy operation, but they will be. You're, you're one of my heroes, but hopefully what you and I have learned the hard way, well, the younger people won't have to learn the hard way. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>